Hey everybody, this is Sheets, and I'm going to be going over the UFC card from Abu Dhabi this weekend. And from a quality perspective, it is uh, it's quite an amazing card. Uh, there were 14 fights, and now they're down to 13. That's fine. Still a pretty big card. And for those that are fans of the sport, there's a whole series of just incredible cards uh, for the next several weeks. Um, the other thing to keep in mind uh, is that it is a 10 a.m. post time on Saturday. So be, be aware of that. Make sure you get your lineups in and set your alarms if, uh, the, if your time zone uh, warrants that in case you want to watch the fights. So one thing I wanted to talk about about this card and in MMA, DFS in general, is you really have to have a, a different look at the slate when you're mass multi-entering. In other words... When you're building one lineup, you have to look at fights one way. And when you're trying to build 150 and, and take down the big GPP, um, you have to kind of have a little more vision with respect to uh, with, with who to play. And, and it's, it's very similar to any other DFS sport, right? I mean, if you want to win the big lottery, you have to get different and you have to play low on low on plays and things like that. And you have to kind of give up a medium projection. You have to give up something obvious if – there's a chance that you can get something low owned to happen and get leverage on all those, you know, on all the popular plays. And MMA is, is a weird sport like that because you, you'd think that in only with only 12, 13 fights that everybody would be kind of owned, but, but there are, there are ownership gluts, you know, and there, there's, there's ownership. Uh, I don't know. There's con ownership gluts with construction. There's ownership gluts with respect to individual fighters. And there's also, you know, some fighters that just go overlooked. Uh, we hit one really, really nicely last week in, uh, in Jonathan Martinez. Um, he was in this range where there was just incredibly good plays around him. Um, it's been only been a week, but I haven't forgot who they were. But suffice to say that from a median projection perspective, he was probably the sixth best play of that range, but his ownership rated to be so low. And given the way results distribute in MMA and how volatile the sport is in general, um, I thought it was a really, really strong play. And it turns out that he, along with Malcoon, just basically broke the slate at about 11% ownership. And if you haven't played MMA DFS, I mean, to have a, a, a fighter at 11%, that's extremely low. Okay, so that's something to keep in mind. The other thing is that the fights that are tend that tend to be low owned are also fights that you know the numbers don't usually support them. In other words, you know, you know if, if you have a fight that's going to be you know, a huge inside the distance prop where it rates the finish inside you know minus three hundred minus four hundred, they're just going to be owned. That's just the way projections work. It's the way people people operate. Like last week, the Jordan Wright to Dorovich fight. I mean, that was just one hundred percent going to be going to be jammed um, on both sides. And it turns out that it was uh, that uh, it worked, right? Todorovic ended up with what did he end up with? 110 or whatever it was, but it did go to two rounds. And who knows? Um, the the fights that tend to be overlooked are the ones that you know don't have the best metrics, you know, that, that that don't have the greatest inside the distance prop. And what's kind of really cool about DFS is that this is this is the Nobel Prize, right? This is this is the thing that really, I don't say needs to be figured out. This is the thing that makes DFS cool is the question of how much in, in reality or how much in projection are you willing to give up in the name of getting a low owned play? And that, that transposed to, to NBA football or whatever it is. In football, if you have a scenario where where a wide receiver rates to get about, you know, 18 fantasy points and another guy rates to be get 17 fantasy points, same price. Yeah. You know, gun to your head. Who do you pick? The guy that's going to score 18. But, but if, if one guy's going to be 80% owned, the other guy's going to be 20. Okay. That's easy. You take the guy that's 17 points and whatever, but what if it's only a 15% ownership gap or what if the projection is, is two points ahead and where does the break even come, you know, come into play of, of where you're, you're giving up too much in the name of ownership. And it's, uh, and, and if you could listen, if you can get the answer to that question, then basically the game is solved, you know, <laughs> and, and that's the end of DFS. But because that's almost an impossible thing to quantify, 
And it's kind of left up to, I don't know, what do you call it, mathematical feel? I guess that's the, that's the best way I could describe it for now. So it makes this game really, really cool. Um, so um, I guess with that said, let's let's get into some of these fights. And I want to keep one thing in the back of our heads as we go through these fights. When should we, <laughs> when should we trust the numbers? Or when should we just say, you know what, the ownership is so wild one way or the other that we could give the ownership, give the numbers a little bit of a pass with this particular situation. Or not so much a pass, but we should, you know, not look at the middle of the bell curve as far as what, what thing we think is going to happen. You know, what if it's a really low owned play that we, yeah, we need something all the way on the right side of the bell curve. Um, but if you get it, you're going to get incredible leverage. So let, let's think about that. And it's, it couldn't be a better place to start than right here with this first fight. So if you look at this first fight, I mean, listen, listen, this is the first fight in a card of, of 13 just killer fights, pretty much. And this one seems to be just kind of just thrown in there for no reason. You know, you have two two women, um, you know, Landsberg and Rosa. You have incredibly poor metrics. Well, not incredibly poor, but let's just take a look at it. So you have Rosa, who's a minus 325 favorite. Um, given her price, I mean, that's it's actually some some line value. In other words, like you're 9,200. Um, that usually implies, well, maybe like a minus 250, minus 260. So, so 9,200, uh, I guess on line value is fair enough, you know, because she's minus 300. But if you look at the underlying metrics, you have her at fight doesn't go to decision is plus 180, you know, and that's, that's really poor for a 9,200 fighter. And then you have Rosa winning by TKO is 400 plus 400. So that's, you know, uh, 20% of the time, I guess that's going to happen. And if you look for Rosa inside the distance, it's plus 250. So you take the average of this. So uh, between minus 360, not plus 250 plus. So you have like a three to one chance that she doesn't finish inside the distance. So 20, you know, 25 to only 25 to 30% of the time she gets a finish. Um, and then if you transpose that to, you know, the first round, which is where you really need her, now we're talking about only about maybe 10% chance or whatever. Um, so on the numbers, especially if you were just single entry or even 20 maxing or something like that, this fight just doesn't exist, right? But but I, I want to encourage you to have a little bit of a vision um, with, with respect to 150 maxing and, and, and playing to win this lottery. This fight is going to be 0% owned, Okay. For all of those reasons, for all the reasons I just mentioned, I mean, there's a zillion other fighters at 9,200 on this card that rate to have a better inside the distance prop or to have good uh, grappling upside and, and things like that. So as a result, and, and the fact that this is the first fight on the night, nobody wants to to put all their chips on the table or at least a sizable amount of them in the first fight of the night. I would say, especially on a card that is so you know fun to watch. Right. You have a 13 fight card that that everybody looks great. I mean, who wants to be out of it after the first stupid women's fight? Right. So 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 this fight in and of itself is going to be just no owned. So I'm going to make the uh, the case that in 150 maxes, I think you do want to play some Carol Rosa here um, from all the, the, the research I've done and the people I've listened to or whatever. She, listen, she's she's younger. Uh, Landsberg is, is 40. Uh, Rosa can have takedowns. Rosa throws a lot of volume. And Rosa's kind of a, has some finishing instincts as well. Um, and I've just seen this happen just too often that a fight like this gets ignored, especially a women's MMA fight. And just somebody just like walks into an early finish or something like that. And next thing you know, like you see all of Twitter and all of Discord's blowing up saying, well, uh, on to the next one. You know, because they they didn't want to play the uh, the host aside because you have all these other quote unquote better plays that are in more fun fights and better fights to watch, and I think then one fifty max I think you should play some Hosa here. Um, she's probably I'm just guessing, you know, twice as unlikely to get there at least as some of these others, but I'm willing to bet I'm not going to bet this, but if, if Hosa is more than 10% owned, I would be surprised. Okay. Um, and you know what? You never know. You know, what if 
what if she does go for a lot of takedowns, gets some success, and over three rounds, she doesn't even get the finish, but maybe gets like five or six takedowns, okay? How many times have we seen that type of type of scenario just play out and somebody score 120 like random points like that? I think that I think their HOSA is a really good kind of cool, low owned way to start off your, your MME builds. Um, not your MME builds. Just make sure that if you strip, you you get over the field on her, like whether it be 10 percent, 15 percent, something like that. I would not X her out. And, and it's tempting to do it, you know, because you look through the, your you look through your, your list and you say, OK, want to make life easy. Who am I going to cross out? I'm going to cross out. I don't know. I'll cross out. um Malcolm Gordon, you know, or I'll cross out, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know who else people would cross out of this card. Maybe, um, uh, actually, I don't even know, Kate and the and I'm not sure. But then you look at this first fight, you're like, you know, I'm not playing Carolosa, it's 9,200. And if I can get rid of her, then I can get so many more combinations of these better plays. And Jose just might get X'd out of some bills just because there's no one else to X out. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm of the opinion that you should be playing. Her. Uh, and that's that. So now you have Mokayev against Malcolm Gordon, and Mokayev is a minus 1,100 favorite for openers, not to mention that it's it's favored to go under one and a half rounds, um, and his inside the distance prop is extremely high, minus 225. So even if you adjust for the juice, like 66% of the time he's going to finish. And, and uh, in addition to that, He's got grappling upside. He's got wrestling. He's got all kinds of all kinds of stuff, you know, that can contribute to either a first round knockout or a bunch of takedowns, control time, and and DraftKings goodness over a couple of rounds. Or maybe most efficiently, maybe gets like three or four takedowns in the first round and finishes him at the very end of the first round and gets everything, you know. Um, so what's the problem? Well, I mean, the problem is is that he's ninety five hundred, right? And, and so what that means, I mean, it doesn't exactly mean this, but what it means is that for him to get into the optimal, he is probably going to need all of those things. In other words, if he scores 100 points at 9,600, I don't think that's going to be enough. I mean, you have two five-round fights of active fighters that I find it hard to believe do not score 100 for both of them, you know? I mean, both of those those top two five round fights, you have reasonable pricing. Uh, so if if those fights, and I don't think that there's a world where those fights don't score a hundred. So unless this Mokaya play can get, I mean, like one twenty, you know, you're you're really asking for, you know, uh, for a lot to happen for it to make the optimal. Can he get one twenty? Sure. Um, definitely, I mean, definitely has a shot to do that. Um, but if he's going to be 50% owned, which is, I mean, I don't see it. Like, I don't see that type of build being so, so popular, you know? Um, I feel as though what's going to happen is people are going to play the, the two main events for openers. And there are these other fights here, like the, like the Muhammad fight, which is full with wrestling and things like that, that people are going to want to play. I don't think people are going to get away with this. Like, let's just say you played M Makaya. And let's just say you played, um, I don't know, just for just for the hell of it here. Let's 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 sort these by fight. Let's play. You say, say you played both underdogs. You played Dillashaw, Dillashaw, and and um, and Oliveira. Then it becomes very difficult to play any more nine Ks. You know, like let's say you liked uh, a Jan or or a Barajo. Okay, like you played Barajo now. I don't know. Maybe you can actually. Now you just have to find one of those Bahamid uh, Bilal plays or whatever. So yeah, you know what? I think I think uh, I think this ownership is real. I think he is going to get to be fifty percent off. So if that's the case, as I was saying, um, he's got to do a lot to justify his price. So I wouldn't go but nuts on it. I think if you're playing single entry, hmm, and I can't recommend an actual lineup, but he's certainly in play. But don't go bananas on him. Like don't 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 play hundred percent of him in, in in GPPs. As a matter of fact, I would probably recommend being under on him. Uh, so yeah, but listen, think about this. Imagine a world where I'm playing 
Carol Hosa at 9,200, but won't pay up 400 more for Mokaya. I mean, that's, I got to be sent to the lunatic asylum for that, right? Um, but I don't know. I've, I've just, I've just seen a lot of these 150 max uh, builds where you get, you get like a Hosa play in. And next thing you know, like you just have everybody just dead. Um, anyway, uh, with respect to Gordon, um, he is very cheap. He is only what 6,500, 6,600. And I don't know. I mean, I, I just, I just don't see him, him justifying, you know, being a, being a plus 900, you know, like that means that less than almost more than 90% of the time he loses. And, and not to mention that if he's going to win, it's probably not going to even score all that great. I can't even, I don't see exactly what his path to victory is, but, but whatever that would be probably would involve just a greasy, I don't even know how, uh, what type of decision. So I just, he's just going to get axed. That's just, that's just the way it's going to be. I mean, being a 90% underdog is really, really tough to overcome. If there was dynamic pricing, he'd probably be 4k or something like that. Um, so uh yeah, so that's that's where I am on that fight. Okay, so you have AJ Dobson against um Armand Petrosian. And this this is this is one that's kind of interesting to me because people always attempt to to try to find underdogs um, because you need to, I mean, you need to find underdogs and sometimes they're easy to come by and sometimes they're not like last week, the Jordan Wright underdog was a very, very easy play to make. Um, it, look, it didn't, it didn't, it didn't work, whatever, but, but that was kind of an easy one to make. There's a lot of, a lot of cards where that happens. And this week I feel as though most of the good underdogs are in kind of like the main events. Um, and as I just kind of went over with the, um, with the uh, with the analysis of Mokaya of the, the Muhammad Mokaya play, um, you don't really need to get down to the seventy one hundred range to make your lineups work. So with that said, I think that the underdogs in these types of fights are going to be very low owned if you can make it work. And I'll tell you that um, from a fight breakdown perspective, this has been very very interesting one to look at over the course of the week because. Well, first let's look at the let's look at the numbers. Um, 9100, 7100, there's really no line value here. Um because he's minus 200 Petrosian. And then we'll get to the we'll get to the the numbers in a second because this is really interesting. What what I have heard this week and this is this is the truth that Petrosian has very very poor takedown defense. And whenever you have that and someone has been you know given the moniker of having a poor poor takedown defense. DFS players are all over this, right? They're like, okay, great. He's got poor day takedown defense. All I need then is for the guy that's going against him to go for takedowns because if he's a big underdog, it's really the only time, it's his only path to victory. It's a legitimate path to victory. And all he needs to do is do that. And not only does the underdog come in, but I get the bonus of having, you know, of having a good fantasy score. So when this matchup comes out, you know, you have this case where Petrosian is, is definitely someone who, yeah, I mean, if you can, you know, if, if he has poor takedown defense, if you're, if you're, if you have someone that's, that can get the takedowns against him, that's it's a tremendous underdog play because it's his win condition, right? Um, the problem is, is that I haven't really seen, I've been trying. But I haven't really seen any content or anything that really is going to suggest that Dobson is going to do this or, or, or is or is is capable of this type of approach. OK, um, it's one of those things that people want him to do. And listen, I've seen this so many times that 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 the DFS community comes to behind a, a fighter. And say, listen, all he needs to do is go for takedowns. and He's a lock. And then they don't go for takedowns. Like, what the hell? You know? Just because we want them to go for takedowns doesn't mean they will. And look, it, it, it goes back to, you know, our DFS uh, players better NFL coaches than the coaches, just because we know that what we want them to do is go for it on fourth down all the time, you know, or, or are we as DFS players better trainers and, and game planners than, than these UFC fighter trainers? I don't know. 
Um, but listen, if I if I saw these metrics and I was AJ Thompson's trainers and then candlers, I would say, hey, let's do it. Let's go for takedowns. But maybe he can't. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe maybe he just can't. Um, and the other thing to think about is that don't you think Petrosian knows this? You know, like if if, if listen, let's just look at Petrosian's last fight, right? So he he gave up a whole bunch of takedowns against uh, against Barajo, right? Who we'll talk about later. Um, don't you think he's going to say, you know, listen, maybe I should just kind of, you know, watch these takedowns. Um, so I don't know. Uh, I, I'm struggling, you know, I, I'd like to try to play Dobson. I might play a little of him just, you know, just in case he, all that kind of comes to pass. Um, but I want to talk about the Petrosian side for a minute, because th this is one side of it. I really haven't seen touted all that much. And he's a 9,100 fighter. Um, and if you look at the numbers, he has an extremely strong inside the distance prop here. You know, you look at it, he is plus a hundred to win by TKO. I mean, that is, I mean, that's legit. You know what I mean? Like this is, this is really strong. So, so normally you have uh, something like this and you, you know, the guy ends up really popular. But on this type of card, for whatever reason, I'm not really hearing too many DFS touts or or content providers recommend the Petrosian side in DFS. So it's possible that he ends up somewhat lower owned, even with this very strong inside the distance prop. I mean, you're going to see Barajo, you know, with all this takedown upside at, at a similar price um, a little bit later, but. I, I don't think we should sleep on the Petrosian side of this. So, so for me, I like the Petrosian side and I'm going to sprinkle the AJ Dobson side, but I just have this weird feeling that the AJ Dobson side is just throwing money away. Um, so I wouldn't play him in say 20 max or anything like that. He would only be a sprinkle in G in, you know, really large field GPPs. Um, okay. Uh, Godsey Omar Godsey against a, Ugapar Nurmagomedov. Um, so this is apparently the weaker of the Nurmagomedov family, and he's still getting uh, still getting favoritism. He's minus one sixty five. Let's take a look at the the uh, what you call it the, uh, pricing here. It's eighty seven hundred versus I guess seventy five hundred. Eighty seven hundred versus seventy five hundred. Uh, uh, Omar. Um, the, the problem here is this. So, so from all the content I've seen, I've seen that that Nurmagomedov is kind of kind of overrated. I think his name uh, probably gives him a little more respect than than he maybe deserves. Um, and I think Omar is a. Uh, is a very live dog here. Um, the, the, the only problem is going to be ownership. Um, I, I have to believe that with the exception of the main events, I think he's going to be pretty, I would imagine he's popular, right? I don't know. Um, so I definitely prefer the Omar side of this. Let's take a look just to uh, look at these numbers, these inside the numbers. Fight doesn't go plus 120, not great. Um, Numaga Medov inside the distance plus 300 plus, you know, minus 400 or something. That's, that's, that's pretty awful. What about Omar inside the distance just for fun? I mean, plus 380, actually it's about the same, right? Like plus 500. So, I mean, it's not great. It, it really is not great. Um, uh, and I would love to see a little more upside for my underdogs. So I'll, I'll regard him as just kind of a play. You know, I, I think he's actually a pretty good play in, in, in 20 max, you know, um, I don't know how great a play he is in, in 150, just because I don't know if he's got that ceiling to, to get maybe like a hundred points or something like that at 7,500. And that's kind of what you're looking for in the 150 max. Is is the ability to get the hundred? If you're playing twenty max, I mean, 
he, he grinds out a decision at 7,500. He scores 85. It's not the end of the world. I mean, you can still win that. But in 150 match, you're going to need more. So uh, I think I'll maybe with the field with him in the uh, 150 max, but nothing else. Um, uh, Nurmaga Madoff, I'm probably off of, off of his side. Um, okay. Tukagov against Almeida. So to me, this is, this is, this is probably my most solid overall pick. If that, if there is such a thing, um, on this card. Um, he's got everything kind of going for him. Um, he's, he's 8,300, which means pricing makes a lot of sense. He also, from what I've gathered, has a very legitimate path to victory in his takedowns. Uh, apparently, Almeida's takedown defense is is really poor, and Tukagov is, is a pretty good grappler. And when you have those two things kind of come together, uh, it's really it's really tough to, to avoid. Um, and the other thing is that you're looking at the line value here. Tukagov is up to minus 170 in some spots and minus 165. So the fact that he is only 8,300, this to me would be like the most solid, you know, cash, three max, 20 max play probably on the board. Um, I, I, I've been so surprised with ownership over the last like, you know, several months that, I'm afraid to say this. I, I was about to say that. How can he not be insanely popular? I guess because there's so many other fighters and better fights that people want to play that maybe he gets ignored. But but this has literally everything. You have line value and you have takedown upside. I mean, to me, this is where you really want to start your overweight uh, is, 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 is too free off. That's, that's my opinion. Um. Okay, um, Krylov versus Ozdemir. Let's take a look at this. You have 8,600, 7,600, and looks as though the price is pretty – here the price is efficient, right? Uh, this is probably where they're supposed to be. With respect to the inside the distance, it's pretty solid. You know, minus 250 to finish. And then if we look to these guys uh, together, Krylov – Inside the distance is a boy. It's about a pick em. I mean, he's a slight dog. Um, so you compare that actually. I mean, you think about it. He actually does look like a better play than Petrosian when you think about it, right? Because he's a little cheaper and his inside the distance prop is almost the same as Petrosian. So I think Krelov is actually very, uh, he's very live here in DFS. The Ozdemir, unfortunately, I, he's going to be my ex. Um, you have to X somebody. And from what I've heard, his path to victory is just not ripe with much upside. Um, so even though you don't need as much 7,600, uh, I, I'm going to probably be off of him. So for me, Krylov is definitely going to make this, well, look at some of these mid range plays that you can play here. I mean, I'm not going to put all these guys in yet, but we'll get back to this. All right. So now you have Murada versus Barajo and, and here we go. You have, let's look at the Barajo side first, obviously. He's minus 205. So his price is somewhat efficient. And he's got these takedown upside. I mean, this is a very, very strong play. You know, his inside the distance prop is, is let's take a look at it, actually. You have Barajo wins inside the distance is plus one, you know, about, Probably minus 200. It's adjusting for VIG. So about, you know, 33% of the time he finishes. But even when he doesn't finish, he has all this takedown point upside that I think that makes up for it. And again, you combine the two things where you get a bunch of takedowns and let's say he gets that submission in the second round. I mean, that's a smash. So I think he's like extremely, extremely strong here. The Muradov side of it, um, Let's, let's take a look at the KO prop because if that's that's where I think you're going to get this. Um, you have Barajo inside the distance. It's, probably, it's about the uh, not Barajo inside the Murata inside the distance about 
I guess minus 375 or plus 375 adjusting for big. So about 22% of the time, I, su I suppose he finishes. I guess that's not bad, right? 22% of finishes. So this is actually, I think, pretty legitimate. You know, I think this, I think this underdog play is 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 not bad. So 22% of the time, he's going to get a KO or of some kind, and at 7,200, I think that's good enough. And I think his ownership is going to be low. So I think that he makes the MME builds rather rather easily, actually. So um, I'm definitely going to be on both sides of this fight. All right, Brady against uh, Muhammad. I, I do have a strong opinion on this one, um, and this is for nothing else, you know. So, so you have both guys who've shown you have sh sh who show incredible wrestling upside, incredible grappling upside, um, and you have a a fight that's just priced right, you know, eighty two hundred eight k. I'll repeat what I said last week, okay, about fights like this. So there are three ways this fight, these fights can go. And we're gonna we're gonna focus on choice C in a minute. So choice A is you have these both these guys with good grappling upside. They just kind of just take turns, you know, controlling, take turns with the takedowns. Pretty close fight. The other the other way that this fight could go is that you have both guys are really strong grapplers and, and wrestlers, and they take kind of X each other out and they end up of kind of a boring striking match. And that that type of thing, I mean, I've heard that that happens, but I've never actually seen it happen. Like this is one of those things where maybe I haven't played DFS long enough to see it, but it seems to be something that people say could happen that never actually does. Right? That's that's my my take on that. But the choice C, which is really interesting, is the one I highlighted last week and a, a couple of weeks before, actually a couple of months before, a couple of months ago, like Ricky Simone was playing was 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 fighting somebody who similar similar path to victory, right? I mean, they were both wrestlers. We weren't quite sure which one was the best one. But the point it was was that if one of them happened to be better than the other one, um, it could completely blow up and have like an incredible score. Because if you have two guys that are singular, singularly focused on one thing and one guy is that is a little bit better than the other one, you could have a big advantage, um, especially when the people are when, when the fighters are not particularly versatile. And that played out exactly perfectly last week in the Mal Kuhn versus um Maximov fight. Nobody was exactly sure what was going to happen. You knew that both were, were very legit wrestlers, and you're like, well, I don't know, maybe Maximov, maybe Malkoon. I'm not sure. And it turns out Malkoon was just better and murdered him like, pretty much. Um, and and Maximov just had no answers for any of it. And I feel as though this is what's going to happen in this type of fight, this fight as well. And I want to add this one thing is that again, I, I I watch a lot of content, I read a lot of stuff. And I would say that for an 8,200 8K fight where Brady's a minus 140, I'm seeing probably about 80% leans towards Muhammad in this, this matchup. Um, I think people are just really looking for that live underdog. And, and what they've seen from Muhammad is, is, is two straight main event. Well, this, well the, the Wonder Boy wasn't a main event, but it felt like it. Two straight match matchups where he just – owned the takedown game and put up really really good scores and you know you have three or four straight wins with the exception of this edwards thing and i think it's very tempting to just kind of play him but for that exact reason i'm just gonna side with brady here uh i think that um he's gonna be lower owned uh, I think that, again, if this fight plays out the way I think, that this one guy is a little bit better than the other one at that exact skill, uh, I think that Brady could could really put up a massive score here. And if you put up a big score at 8,200, I mean, that's that's really, really good. Am I going to play any of Muhammad? I mean, sure. But I'm only going to play Muhammad with the low – like, I don't think I'm going to have Muhammad with, 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 with chalk. Like, that's – I'll play Muhammad with like with like Hosa from like the first fight. You know what I mean? Like that's where I'm gonna probably get my Muhammad exposure. I just think he's gonna be too popular. Um and uh I think that Brady is is I think Brady's got more of a chance to put up an enormous score than Muhammad. That's that's just my opinion. Uh okay, Fioro against Chukagian. Um right. So you have 8,900 versus 7,300. And 
let's take a look at the line value here. There's not really a lot of line value. I would actually say that there might, maybe, I mean, Fioro, you could argue should be a little bit higher, maybe 9K, 9,100, um, but not too much. With respect to the inside the distance prop, it's 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 pretty poor, actually. You have Fioro winning inside the distance as like a plus 400. Um, and like you compare that to, to Hosa, for example, who's just a little bit more expensive. Like Hosa inside the distance, what did we say? Was 300. And I promise you this, Fioro is going to be much higher owned than, than Hosa. Um, because, you know, Fioro is awesome. Everybody loves playing Fioro. She always scores. I mean, she always does well. She's 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 amazing, you know. Um, but Chukagian's no joke. You know, she's been around the block. She she doesn't really get finished, you know. And I don't know. I, I just I just suspect this fight just kind of plays out on the feed. And um, I, just, I just don't see either fighter – really putting up enough fantasy points to make this work. I mean, if anybody, I, well, I was about to say if anybody, I would take Chukagian here in DFS, but not, not really. I mean, again, uh, the only thing I would say is 7,300, you don't need as much as, as someone from 7,600. Because I really don't see a big score out of Chukagian in this fight. If anybody's going to get a ceiling, it's going to be Fioro. Um, so if I were playing this fight, it would probably be Fioro. And, and no Chukagian, um, but I'm probably going to be off of both of these fighters. Again, I think that Hosa is probably a better play than Fior Fioro, given the metrics. All right, so Mateus Gamrot versus Benil Darius. You have 8,800 versus 7,400. Um, take a look at the odds. They're pretty, pretty efficient. And let's take a look at the inside the distance props. You have... Gamrot winning inside the distance is going to be plus 250. I mean, adjusting for price, it's minus 300. I mean, not great. And Diaru, Benil Diaru, uh, Dariush, I mean, uh, it's pretty awful. I, I, I'm going to put a take out there. I mean, again, I, I give very few takes based on my own observation because I just don't think I'm qualified to beat the – you know, beat the line necessarily, but uh, I, I watched the Gamrot uh, Sarukian fight from last last time they fought. Not Sarukian, yeah, Sarukian. Dude, this guy's awesome. Okay, that that whole fight was amazing. Like, I, I encourage everybody to watch that fight. I mean, these two guys were just going after it. You know, defending takedowns, takedowns, grappling, whatever it is. You have Darius coming off of a bunch of injuries. I, I think I think Gamrot is a lot of upside here. Um, so uh, I, I'm going to play the, the Gamrot side. I'm probably not going to play the Darius side. Um, and again, it's probably, again, putting my bias and my own observations above everything else. But that's, I just, I, listen, I know what I saw. You know, I saw Darius against a, like a withered Tony Ferguson just basically hanging on. And I saw Gamrot like in one of the more exciting fights. I mean, seriously, one of the more exciting decision fights showing incredible freaking technique like both of these guys. Um, I think I think that he's gonna I think he's gonna put it on him. I really do. Um, so I, I do like the Gamrot side. I'm probably not gonna play much of Gary Ush. Um, so before we get to the two five round dice, now we get to Peter Yan versus Sean O'Malley. And you have Peter Yan at minus two sixty. And you look at the price, he's ninety three hundred. So I guess he's pretty fairly pri priced there. And you look at the inside the distance props, you have uh Inside the distance is actually pretty poor. You have Jan inside the distance is like basically plus 300, which is really poor for 9,300. With respect to grappling upside, um, I, I've heard that there's a possibility that he goes for takedowns, um, which certainly helps. But I have also seen that he's, I don't know, I've heard this narrative that he's a slow starter. Yeah, okay. And in five round fights, he's a slow starter, but 
and we talked about this last week with respect to Arahu and and and, and, and uh, Grasso. The whole narrative last week was that was that Grasso, because she tired in the third round in other fights, not t- Grasso, that Arahu, when she tired in the third round after you know it, when she tired in the third round and three round fights, that she was not going to be able to cardio in the five, in five round fights. And I thought that was a kind of a fraudulent take. I mean, you, you pace your fight based on how long it is, you know. And I felt as though Arahu could show cardio for five rounds if she paced herself that way. And, and you know what she did? I mean, she lost, but. It wasn't because of a lack of cardio. It was just because she got beat, you know. But I think it's the same thing with Peter Jan. I think that Jan, because, okay, so he could slow starts in five-round fights, but I think that he's not an idiot. I mean, he knows that he can't give a give a round away in a three-round fight. I think he's probably going to come after it. So I, I actually think that the inside the distance prop is a little bit – is a little bit uh, – is a little bit light here. I mean, if I were betting, I would probably bet on Jan inside the distance. That would be my – by lean. So if that's the case, I, I, I suppose I have to kind of lean towards Jan um, in DFS. The problem is that 9,300 is so tough, you know, when, when you have to stretch for that inside the distance. You know, you have that, you go back to, to, uh, to, uh, to Mokaya. I mean, he's like, I mean, it's just so much more likely to finish and so much more likely to finish early for an extra 200. I mean, it's so hard to justify Jan over Makaya. I think I think you kind of have to play them. What you have to do is you have to run your lineups and say, okay, like which which uh, I mean, what's the two hundred really getting? And you'll see when you build. I mean, you'll see what you can get to with the extra two hundred. Um, but if it's not going to get you much, you just probably should just pay up the extra two hundred for Makaya, even though you know, even though you're going to get, you know, he's going to be. I was twice his own, but pretty close, I imagine. But I do like Jan inside the distance here, and I do like him in DFS, but I don't know. Um, O'Malley, uh, O'Malley, I just don't like him in the spot. I don't think he has a lot of KO upside. His inside the distance prop, I think, is pretty poor. Um, and O'Malley inside this plus six, six, 650. I mean, that's rough. I mean, the only thing I would say is that his price is fair, but – I just a price being fair is not good enough for me. So I'm probably going to be off Bill Maui. And uh, if anything, I'll take some shots with Jan. So now we're at the two uh, five round fights. And and the unfortunate reality is that I do think it's going to be difficult to fade these fights. Um, I think you have two fights of very active, well, two fights of fighters that can score well, which have five rounds to prove it. And, and I think that these are, Unfortunately, very difficult fights to fade. Now, again, in GPPs, you know, and in 150 maxers, and you could try. Um, and I know that there are people out there that try to do this and say, oh, no big deal. I'll fade Oliver and Makachev. I'll fade, um, whatchamacallit, I'll, I'll fade the other one, the the, the uh, Sterling fight, and I'll just hope that the other six guys get, the, get 120 points or something like that. Yeah, I mean, you're certainly going to be unique that way. But the chances that both fights dud is just just very small, I think. Um, well, let's take a look at it. Let's take a look at Sterling. He's a minus 180 versus Dillashaw, plus 140. And the pricing is, I guess, somewhat fair. I guess you could argue that Sterling might have a little bit of line value, but not much. And... The inside the distance prop is not particularly strong in this fight. Um, I would say not strong at all. Let's take a look. Fight doesn't go plus 140. I mean, so it's pro- it, it, it's about a pick them, I guess, to go to decision. Um, and I think it's spread out across both guys pretty equally. Um, you have Sterling inside the distance, but, you know, probably 20% chance, line adjusted. Pretty much the same with Dillashaw. So their inside the distance props are similar. Um, but the thing is, is that there's grappling on both sides of this game and, and, and of this fight, and you get five rounds to rack up points in, in, with grappling. Uh, it's, uh, it's a tough fight to fade. Um, with respect to my opinion on it, yeah. listen, this, I love, love when people say this too, you know, if I knew that Dillashaw was going to be fresh and you were getting the old t- you know, TJ Dillashaw, you know, I think he's, he's a great bet here. Okay, great. Thanks. That doesn't really help me too much, right? Because he's not the same. He has been away, and it's just a little different. Um, so I don't know. I think it's a. I think it's either way. I mean, 
I guess if I had to, I would say Dillashaw just because he's the underdog and he opens up other stuff. Um, but aside from that, I think both sides are pretty fair. And then you get to Makachev against Oliveira. I mean, Oliveira, I, I imagine, is going to be the most popular, certainly the most popular underdog on the slate, if not the most popular fighter. The only reason he wouldn't be the most popular fighter is because um, is because Mokayev. <laughs> uh, you can get him in a little bit too easily, I think, today, uh, or on the slate. Um, but look, I mean, this fight's it, it's just fantasy upside. It, it's fantasy galore. I mean, you have... Oliveira, who just finishes people like it's his job. I mean, it is his job. Right? He's a finisher. He's active. He's got five rounds to work with, and and he's he's only seven what seventy six hundred something like that. Um, seven eight hundred. I mean, it's it's just a smash play. And then you have on the other side, you have Makachev, who he's just a takedown machine, you know. And 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 you get five rounds of a takedown machine. Not to mention he's plus minus one ninety. I mean, you're getting you know line value here too, sort of, you know. So you're getting line value and you're getting takedown upside, all this stuff. I mean, he's and he's a smash play too. So I don't know if I have it in me to fade this fight. I really don't. Um even in in, in one fifty max, it's just it's just it's just gonna it's gonna score a hundred. It it just is. Um, and if you have $8,400 fighters and seventy eight hundred dollars fighters scoring a hundred and you don't have them, it just puts so much pressure on you to be perfect with the rest of this. Um, so anyway, that, that, that's, that's where I'm with that. So, I, so I guess like in summary, um, let, let's kind of review, uh, I guess let's review kind of the underdogs I want to take shots with. Let's take the mid range guys. I want to prioritize and things like that. Um, I do like the Hosa as far as the GPP plays play is concerned. Um, we talked about Makaya. I mean, obviously you can play him great. I, I am going to sprinkle some AJ Dobson. I just think the win condition is too strong to avoid. If in fact that he knows he's supposed to go for takedowns and he can get away with it, that's that's great. Um, so I definitely think he's live. I think that Godzi Omar Godziev is extremely live as an underdog. Um I think Zukav is kind of a lock. I mean, I think it's an extremely strong play. He's a mathematical theoretical lock. You know, he's a minus 160 who's being priced as as as, as nothing, you know, and he's got take that up. I think he's the best. I think he's the best play on the board, you know, um, if there was no five round fights. Um, I like don't like Ozdemir at all. He's an X. Uh Muradov is gonna get sprinkled. So I guess Muradov and Dobson. Are, are the sprinkles of the non uh, main event fights. Um, I like, I prefer Brady over Muhammad. If you want to take a stand, and this is again, kind of a dangerous stand here. You want to X Muhammad. That's, that's an interesting thing you could do because you are well over the field, right? I mean, well under the field, if you do that, obviously. And, um, you know, it gets you more combinations of the others. Uh, Chukagian, I just don't think I can get it done uh, as her as an underdog. Dariush, no. Uh, O'Malley, no. And obviously, only if Oliveira is, is a very strong one. So, um, it's going to be an awesome card. And I think that I think the GPP results are, are going to be, as usual, maybe not what people think. Uh, um, I could see variations where where you get Muradov, Hosa, and, um, uh, and Dobson. You get all three of those, you know, scoring. That that's the way you win the whole the whole the whole shebang. Um, we'll see. Uh, good luck, everybody. Remember, ten a.m. sharp start time.